Hello everyone and thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Sophie Gerald, and on behalf of the British Neuroscience Association, I'd like to give a very warm welcome to the fourth webinar in this series, which is hosted with our partners, the Psychiatry Consortium. I want to note my sincere thanks to you all for taking the time to be with us today, especially in light of the recent shocking events. With so many of us feeling wretched and powerless, coming together to celebrate the sharing of ideas feels not insignificant. Today is International Women's Day, and so I'd like to dedicate this to all the incredible women working tirelessly to keep labs running, hospitals staffed, and carrying children across the globe, but especially to those affected by war. We feel very fortunate to be joined by attendees from all over the world, so do let us know when you're, where you're dining in from and say hello in the chat. Just before we start, and whilst people are still joining, we have a few housekeeping rules to go over. We'll be using the chat and Q&A function today, so do feel free to say hello and post comments in the chat. But if you have any specific questions for our speakers, then please make sure you use the Q&A function for these. You should see them both at the bottom of your screen. There will be a nice Q&A session after the talks with a chance for our panelists to answer any questions you may have. So please do feel free to post your questions anytime during the talks and we'll pick them up at the end. You can also post questions anonymously if you wish to do so. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind you that this webinar is being recorded with the permission of our speakers and will be available to watch on demand and on the BNA's YouTube channel after the event. And finally, just a reminder to please adhere to the BNA's code of conduct for webinars and engage respectfully online. We are delighted to be working with Laura Ajram from the Psychiatry Consortium, working together to strengthen the links between psychiatry and neuroscience, highlighting the importance of a collaborative process between industry and academia within the drug discovery process. We hope this series will humanise the research story and provide an opportunity to openly discuss the different stages of the research pipeline from all perspectives, from people with lived experience of mental health and clinicians to academic researchers and industry scientists. As our friend and extraordinary patient advocate Matt Eagle says, drug discovery is about relationships and human interaction. The more human you can make it, the better. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Laura. Laura Ashram, over to you. Thank you so much, Sophie. Um, so as Sophie said, I'm here today to welcome you on behalf of the Psychiatry Consortium. Um, and we've been working together with the BNA for some time now to bring together this comprehensive overview of the challenges and opportunities for neuroscience drug discovery from a range of different perspectives. Um, so it's great to to really bring together the industry perspective in this particular webinar today. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Psychiatry Consortium is a strategic collaboration of global pharmaceutical companies, three of which are represented in today's webinar, which is brilliant. Um, and those companies work together to accelerate the validation of novel treatment targets across psychiatric conditions in order to collaboratively develop groundbreaking research, which will hopefully ultimately provide new treatment options for patients and their loved ones. Like today, a big part of what we do is to bring the research community together over shared challenges, but we also provide funding and facilitate collaborative research projects as well. And then our next funding call will be open later this month. So please do sign up to our newsletter um, and have a look on our website to be the first to know about those funding opportunities. And I'll post a link in the chat so you can find out more about that. So today we've got three brilliant scientists with us um, and it's my absolute pleasure to introduce the chair of the session, Dr. Marianthi Papakosta. Marianthi is an experienced drug discovery neurobiologist with small molecule expertise, having worked in the pharmaceutical industry for 20 years. She's led multidisciplinary project teams in neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration, pain and immunology, from target identification through lead optimization and candidate selection. Marianthi is currently Head of In Vitro Biology and Neuroscience Drug Discovery Research at Takeda, where she's managing a team of scientists developing complex human cellular systems to support projects at various stages of discovery, from target identification all the way through to the clinic. 
Important aspects of her role are to lead research programmes, establish and manage external alliances with key opinion leaders, procure investment for projects and capital, and work with CROs to push forward projects where they're unable to do so in-house. So I think this is going to really feed into the discussion today around that collaborative working, and Marianthi is going to be able to bring some really valuable insights into that discussion with our two speakers. So I'm really glad to have you here with us today, Marianthi, particularly as you're in the US and it's currently very early in the morning for you. So um, good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'll hand over to you now to learn a bit more about your experience and to introduce our speakers and discussion today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone from uh, San Diego, US. Uh, uh, my turn, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to chair this uh, webinar session today. And a uh, few things from my experience, uh, very briefly. Uh, during my years in, uh, in industry, I have witnessed the real transformation, I would say, how industry conducts drug discovery. Uh, physically, our sites uh, have uh, been located in isolation uh, in, uh, in the past. Uh, now that's not the case. Uh, you see that our sites are very close to academic institutions. They are surrounded by small biotech companies, other big pharmas, uh, and hospitals. And that was a very conscious decision uh, by industry because we really want to harness the innovative ideas that are born in academia and also to enable uh, close collaborations uh, with our drug discovery scientists. Today, it's almost unthinkable, really, not to collaborate with academia. And uh, these collaborations uh, are sometimes short in duration or lengthier ones. They could be between a, a PI of uh, an academic institution and uh, the project lead in, uh, in industry. Um, but it, they could be also in a more grander scale uh, relationships through consortia where a number of different companies uh, and academic institutions are collaborating. From my experience, um, the most successful collaborations are those that they have specific aims, specific deliverables and timelines that um, they can definitely uh, work well with the aggressive timelines of uh, industry because uh, we work really, really hard to be able to push drugs to the clinic, but also take into uh, account um, the sensitive uh, and being sensitive to the needs of uh, the partners. At this stage, I would like um, to stop and introduce uh, the first speaker of today's webinar, that is Aslihan Semimpeyoglu. A uh, few things about Aslihan. Uh, Aslihan is a senior scientist at Compass Pathways, and uh, there she's leading the company systems and also a translational research team of talented neuroscientists uh, with a breadth of, breadth of experience from uh, in vivo electrophysiology to experimental medicine. Aslihan oversees all the academic and industry collaborations and contributes to the company science platforms and investments. She's also leading the scientific relationships with the psychiatry consortium. Aslihan has a PhD in neuroscience from Stanford University, MSc in neuroscience from Istanbul University and BSc in molecular biology from Istanbul Technical University. Uh, Aslihan, uh, please, uh, you can start. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction, my answer. Um, let me share my presentation. Oops. Can I? Mm, sorry, I need to figure out how to. Does, can anyone help me here? Oh, yeah, go, actually. All right. Okay. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. As Marianta told me, I'm leading the translational neuroscience team at Compass. And I would like to start with introducing. Compass a little bit to you today. Um, Compass is a young company. Um, we were founded a few years ago with um, 
the very kind of personal, uh, personal motivated um, idea of our co-founders to bring um, psychedelic compounds, especially psilocybin, to a very much in need population of treatment resistant depression patients. Um, so in that realm, we recently successfully closed our phase two study and we are working to start our phase three trials. Um, and obviously getting into clinical development meant a lot of collaborations with both with academia and industry. Uh, and we are now trying really hard to um, expand our preclinical portfolio and looking to network with uh, more partners as we go. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about our experiences and takeaways from the collaborations so far, um, and hopefully this is going to inspire and instigate more relationships between academia and industry. Um, so in Compass, we are a growing team. We are over 100 people, unlike um, a small team that I joined about three year, years ago, about 10, 15. Um, so that growth, obviously, in the internal growth, was very much also accompanied by our external um, experimental research collaborators. So we do not own our own labs, which means all the experimental research that we do on both preclinical and clinical side is done by our partners and academia, contract research organizations. Um, and I really find academia obviously is very well suited um, for running, especially um, high risk studies that might lead to translational valuable models and novel targets for our preclinical team. Um, and I want to kind of just touch base on to start with is how I see that there's a lot of um, potential beneficial think inputs from both our side and academia. Um, and I would like to obviously stress that we, we should leverage these strengths of each side when we're interacting. Um, so from academia, obviously um, the, the scientists have the best possible understanding of biological basis of, um, of therapeutic action um, and they might help us create novel translational biomarkers, which as we all know, the psychiatry needs very much of. Um, we do, especially with the help of psychiatric consortium these days, also get to um, be exposed to some ideas on novel targets um, and the biological basis of psychiatric disorders that we are interested in. Um, to me, really, but academia, how academia differentiates from um, industry is their appetite for high risk, cutting edge science, um, and sometimes ability to use of really high cost techniques that maybe not um, all companies might, might have their hands on. Um, and that I think very forward looking, risk taking and more exploratory free approach of academia is, is really obviously beneficial for advancing science and drug discovery. Um, for campus side, obviously we are a company that is developing psilocybin, so we have a lot of experience with this particular compound, but just in general also in psychedelics. Um, so that means the Academics who have interest in psychedelics, you know, please feel free to approach us and um, we would be happy to share our knowledge with you as much as we can. Um, we do have, obviously, an in our expertise of drug discovery and development. Um, and our current therapeutic model is quite unique in the sense that we have psilocybin, our synthetic psilocybin, COMP360, as a pharmaceutical inter um, intervention, uh, which is Company it with a psychological support model to help patients go through this um, potentially very um, psychoactive experience. So um, this, this is something that we also specialize in. Um, we obviously have our um, current insights into the patient populations that we're interested in. So I mentioned treatment resistant depression, but we can also add PTSD, anorexia nervosa, bipolar depression, um, and some others. Um, and obviously, as in the industry time, we also offer some funding opportunities either for the studies that we are interested in or maybe potential ideas that might come from the academic side. Um, so I want to then jump into a little bit of 
how we do um, set, especially on the preclinical side, the research collaborations with academia and what we've been finding challenging. Um, so then hopefully we can think about how to improve some of these. So we always pretty much always start with the idea of proposal generation state and then try to find if there is an interesting proposal for experimental, some funding schemes to support this. And then we move on to contracting that uh, with the partner. Um, in our case, most of the time this includes um, licensing because we're dealing with a scheduled compound and shipping that compound. And then finally, we move on to the experimental stage. So very quickly, I think the, the on the idea of proposal generation section, obviously, a lot of the networking that we have in academia is right now is based on just serendipitous introductions. It could be as simple as a researcher emailing us on our website or us meeting on an event or finding a paper that we are interested in. Um, and obviously um, this, this all you know, requires a bit of like networking effort from both sides. And in terms of specific ideas, there's always, I think, a bit of like tension of obviously the academia side trying to explore and uh, the industry side being a bit more output driven. Um, so there's always a, try, a, a bit of trying to balance the basic science, but also the translational valuable outputs towards clinical development, um, which obviously comes with the caveat of generally a lack of those current available translational valuable tools. Um, then if we can create a proposal, the funding scheme, generally the challenges we have around this um, obviously depends on you know, our, our resources. Um, we do, I wanna uh, say that are very flexible. So we can directly fund a proposal, but we could also support the, the, the projects in multiple different ways. Um, what we have experienced is obviously gain an alignment between the strategic objectives of industry um, and budgeting um, and the more, I guess, like an exploratory outlook from, from academia. Um, when, we, when it comes to industry academia collaborative grants, most of them do not offer enough funding for, I would say, you know, very big, meaningful outcomes, but they're generally very good starting points. Um, if we find funding, then we generally move on to building a contract. Uh, so that means that both sides, especially on the legal front, need to reach an agreement of ownership of IP and data, which obviously are extremely important for both sides. Um, so that generally requires quite lengthy discussions um, and sometimes causes delays in the project. Similarly, there's a lot of governmental regulations that we need to follow. So generally this step is a step that we see where everyone needs to be a little bit of patient and, and maybe expect that there will be delays if, if we get to the contracting and licensing. Um, and finally, the experiments and analysis. So in, in preclinical, obviously this means um, a lot of years, generally for the projects that we uh, are signed on, means um, have a timeline about, you know, starting from a year up to four years or even longer. Um, what we try to do in terms of experiments analysis is to have preclinical output that has very high quality. So we are trying to approach preclinical data almost on par with very clinical data, which is obviously um, well regulated and needs to follow certain standards. Um, so it's very important for us that we apply blinding, assigning groups, numbers, analysis plans from early on, everything to, for, um, to, to really make sure that quality is going to be there. Um, we, we also really do value data application, uh, which obviously is a huge challenge just in general in science um, and of animal welfare we, we care about. So we try to create our guidelines to make sure that this is going to also be the standards of the animal welfare will be very high. Um, so if we move on to some opportunities, oops, sorry, okay, here. Um, so in terms of um, networking, as I said, we do try to be a bit of a proactive um, nature of this. Um, I do 
also really value uh, if we can create some research scientists, which the research centers, which could mean um, multiple collaborators in one institution. Um, so instead of having a lot of different um, collaborators, we can just um, have one uh, have uh, have multiples in in one institution, so that really strengthens relationship and then also runs the whole process a bit more quickly. Um, we we do like to continue relationships with follow up projects, so we don't really see any of our relationships as a one off project. Um, and um, then we move on to um, if we move on to funding, I think. It's the most important thing here is to stress flexibility. So it's even if we do not sometimes, you know, maybe able to fund a whole study, uh, we can provide letter of support, some maybe partial funding. Uh, we could try to collaborate with other industrial partners. I think psychiatric consortium is a great way of demonstrating that potential cost and risk minim uh, minimization. We do collaborate could collaborate with alternative stakeholders. They don't need to be all industry. Um, or we can, if we cannot fund a full proposal, we can try to kind of downscale it and create multiple milestones and uh, create smaller budgets, budgets. So as the process keeps being successful, we can create more and more resources on this. So I guess the, for me, the opportunity here is to have a really flexible mind. Uh, then, Moving on to contracts uh, and licensing and shipping, as I mentioned, I think this requires a really close communication and proactive communication with legal departments, both in the industry and academic side, and advocating for faster, easier processes. That's obviously the responsibility of both sides. Um, and I think if either party or both parties can have a clear view on the IP data value, this really makes the process much easier. So um, I think it's it's again um, a bit of you know, a process, but at the same time, um, I would encourage all the academicians to, you know, not just maybe focus on science, but if you want to collaborate with the industry, is to also, you know, get an understanding of legal and economic side of these projects as well and build those relationships with your uh, particular departments. And finally, on the, the then doing the experiment side, what we find really valuable is frequent touch points between collaborators, so ourselves and academia, um, so that you know if things need to change, if we need to pivot, um, we can act very quickly. Uh, we do like to do a bit of like initial scenario planning because again, we are for our um, same same with a lot of other companies. And maybe even more for us because we are pre-revenue. Uh, we are uh, spending the resources of, of our investors, most of them come from public. So we want to make sure that although inherently there are risks in these projects, that no matter what outcome we are going to get, there is going to be some learning and some um, meaningful output. Um, similarly, we would also like to plan analysis and stats approach from the beginning um, and make sure that the, there is going to be a high quality execution and reporting at the end. So again, you know, unlike in academia, maybe we could, unless we publish, maybe get away with, you know, like small reports, uh, we, we really have to make sure that there is going to be a very de um, dedicated, um, high quality reporting process. Um, also, we try to insert data replication steps. So if possible, we do actually repeat our experiments even in the same projects, um, either by different labs or the same lab multiple times, um, which really actually helps a lot for us to rely on that data, especially you know, when you think of this, this drug discovery, this data might then take a step towards getting something into you know, like the, the patient's uh, and that's just so important that we have to know that that data has to be trusted. Um, and finally, on animal welfare awareness and education, uh, we do obviously train our team, and I know academic institutions do the same, um, but it's also just having a conversation. So we make sure that not only we have the processes, internal processes in place, but with every project, we make sure that we discuss uh, if there is any room for improvement in this, in this area as well. 
So stop here for a few seconds to see if there's any questions. Maybe, Varianti, you want to jump in? Yeah, uh, I was muted. Okay. Uh, yes, there is one question. Um, why is academia more suited to run high risk studies compared to industry? Yeah, so um, the industry, I mean, this, this obviously you now needs to be taken in, in context. Um, I think that the nature of academia, you know, it is to, to generate new information and just to, you know, explore and find what is unknown. In industry, we have a very clear goal of serving patients, and that's why our company and many others are built. So whatever research we do, there is a very clear of we want to create something that's going to serve the patients at the end. And that's that I think just by nature uh, sometimes does open the door of very high risk studies, but sometimes um, kind of limits us that unless we can prove that there is one uh, some some I think relevance to the patients in the future, maybe you know just like for the sake of doing a study out of curiosity, out of creating new knowledge, which might not be the right thing um, and the right way of spending our resources in industry. Cool. Hey, that's it for the moment. Perfect. Okay, so um, then I want to move into maybe, um, hopefully this is going to be helpful, um, some experimental parameters and concepts. Um, so when I especially started working with psychiatric consortium, um, what I think I realized also coming from academia and now working with industry and now turning back and working with academia again, um, there is a very clear conceptual framework in terms of drug discovery and development in most industry, industrial organizations' mind, which uh, is not, I think, necessarily in the radar of academic researchers. So if you go, for example, to the website of a lab, you would generally see, you know, like a, a scientific idea or a framework or concept that they're interested in, and they would do all the research towards um, trying to create more knowledge towards that, that concept. Um, but again, I think similar to my answer just now, in our minds in industry, we always think about um, a, basically a drug discovery pipeline and how we are going to get this into clinical development and eventually to the patients. And we have to look at it as a full picture right now. So here you see like a very classical drug development pipeline from target to um, hit and to, to then, you know, further preclinical development and finally the clinical development. So we have to look at this, this full picture and we need to fill in all the data that's required for all these steps. So that means Early on, even you know, in the very early on of the st stages of the projects, we need to think about safety because again, you know, what if it gets to patients and it's not safe? So that means we need to think about specificity of target engagement. We need to think about adverse effects. We need to think about toxicity. And I don't mean to say all scientific projects need to address all these points, but I think it's extremely useful, for example, for a scientist who is trying to create novel targets is to keep these questions at the tip of their mind and think about whether they can collaborate or find ways to address these questions or even like at least be uh, on top of the literature if there are some answers there already. Um, the second thing, again, we think about a lot is bioavailability. So how this drug is going to get to patients in a meaningful way. So very early on, we would like to do some simple pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic studies. We would like to think about the route. We would like to think about what those we are going to apply if, you know, say it's like an oral drug or we would like to try, think of a, like a dose response curve. Um, so again, I think it's just really useful. There are some extremely easy experiments that pretty much any lab with, you know, any wet lab could do to answer these questions. Um, and I, for example, I'm aware, and I've done it a lot in academia, a lot would just, just pick one dose that seemed to be most relevant and do all the experiments with that one dose. And again, if you come to industry, well, actually it's quite 
risky and sometimes doesn't really give good answers to see everything with one dose because we would like to know how a lower or higher this um, dose would, um, would respond. And finally, as you go towards obviously the uh, higher levels of development, we have efficacy. Um, and to efficacy, um, when to prove efficacy, we generally use the in vivo animal models and eventually to humans. Um, and there is obviously in psychiatry the the issues around um, finding animal models that will that could be clinically validated. Um, so I think here it's it's again really important for us to think about when we are using an animal model whether this was clinically validated before or if not how it could be validated in humans um, and maybe even think about what kind of new animal models we could de design to build this translational um, value um, instead of you know just kind of using the same models maybe that that didn't really show a lot of validation um, and the other concept that i think is really important here is is causality obviously again by nature of a lot of experiments um, there is the consequences of the experiments give us a lot of really cool, I think, correlations. Um, but again, we, we have to, if we have to take these to take to the patients, I think building as much as possible causal links between um, data is, is really crucial. Um, and I think there are now really cool new techniques in neuroscience uh, that, that actually help build that link. Um, so, and I wanted to also bring Maybe one more thing when we talk about efficacy and animal models and stuff, we in, in Compass, we are trying really to embrace our a trans diagnostic translational framework. And I think we try to apply to psychedelics as, as much as possible as well. And I just wanted to kind of show this slide very quickly, just to say, I think there are ways to do that. Um, and there are ways to study psychedelics from a trans diagnostic framework. Any questions, or I don't really know how I'm doing in time. I can stop any time that's necessary. Yeah, we will need to move to the second yeah. speech, Jean, yeah. at this very moment. But thank you, Aslikan, for the exceptional uh, You're very welcome. presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, and at this stage, I would like to introduce uh, Jean Bolger. Uh, Jean uh, is uh, currently uh, Vice President and of Venture Investments at Johnson & Johnson Innovation. Her responsibilities are focused on investing and managing portfolio investments in startup and early uh, stage life science companies in the areas of strategic interest uh, to J&J. &J. Uh, she's uh, uh, represented J&J on a board of directors of over dozen companies, also VC funds and other financial uh, financing vehicles. She has 35 years of pharmaceutical industry experience in management roles across R&D. And uh, Jean received her medical degree from University College uh, Dublin. She's a fellow of the Royal Academy of Medicine of Ireland. And uh, she's a visiting lecturer uh, on the MSc Pharmaceutical Medicine Curriculum at Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland. At this stage, uh, I think, Jean, you can go on with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just to a sound check, make sure you can hear me. Does that work? You have started screen share. Participants can now see your application. Okay. Thank you very much, Marianthi, for the introduction. Um, so, um, I'm just going to take you through um, as quickly as I can so that we have enough time at the end for uh, discussion um, and, and Q&A across the board here. I just want to take you um, uh, through how we in J&J &J, um, view the opportunity for uh, accelerating innovation in EMEA. So J&J has been um, around uh, We have three business segments, as you probably know, um, pharmaceuticals and biotechnology, medical devices and consumer. Um, we sell products in more than 175 countries. 
And um, as an example of our investment in R&D in 2021, we invested nearly $15 billion in R&D. Um, over a billion people use J&J products worldwide every day. Okay, let's see, can I scroll, sorry. Um, so there's no question that uh, over um, many years, uh, innovation has changed the trajectory of healthcare. Um, we've seen very significant increase in life expectancy um, uh, and specific to certain diseases um, have been uh, transformed like HIV from a fatal disease uh, to one that can promise near normal life expectancy uh, treated with a single pill once a day. Um, we're now in an environment of targeted ther therapies and personalized solutions. It's, you know, this is part of the current innovation that we're all seeing. Um, we're involved as J&J &J in robotics, surgical robotics and uh, digital surgery. Um, and we're very committed to long acting treatments to improve convenience for our patients. However, there are still tremendous challenges in healthcare. Uh, in certain diseases like cancer and HIV, Alzheimer's disease, huge problem for aging populations, uh, even heart disease, uh, there continues to be a high unmet need. Uh, tuberculosis has seen an emergence of multidrug resistant strains. Um, and, uh, you know, not even mentioning COVID-19, uh, as we have all experienced in the last two years, but Ebola and other pandemics are a continuing challenge for healthcare in different parts of the world. Um, and it's still not the case that, that uh, safe surgical practices can be adopted in every part of the world. So there are important needs that we're seeking to address as a healthcare company. As we think about innovation, we recognize that um, the, the level of innovation that's necessary to be successful has dramatically increased uh, because, and this is really, I suppose, it, with particular focus on uh, biotherapeutics and, and uh, pharmaceutical compounds, that there are a lot of needs that are substantially met. And in order uh, to really move the needle, um, you've got to anticipate the very prolonged time frame uh, that it will take to develop a new drug. Um, and you've got to be confident as you set out on that path that there will still be a difference in terms of the outcome in, you know, there will be differentiation in your product by the time you bring your product to market. Um, so this has become a very expensive exercise, but a good thing for the industry, I think, you know, um, uh, Marianthe mentioned that I've been more than 35 years in the industry. And honestly, when I joined the industry that all that time ago, there were many Me Too drugs. I now genuinely don't see the industry uh, committing their resources uh, to Me Too drug development. It is really all about di differentiation and uh, meaningful degrees of innovation. So how do we go about seeking that innovation? I think it's really an important step that we took um, uh, about eight years ago to outwardly recognize that um, most innovation was not going to come from inside j, j And this is despite being a company that I described, you know, has an enormous R&D budget, commits a huge amount of resources uh, to finding internal innovation um, uh, and has um, an employee headcount of some 130,000 people. So it's like a, you know, it's, it's, it's a very meaningful exercise, the internal effort on innovation. But we recognize that most innovation actually is outside JNJ. And so we set up eight years ago, uh, these regional innovation teams. Um, we established four innovation centers in what we considered uh, hotspots for life sciences. Um, and uh, we use those as a kind of launch pads to access the broader ecosystem where that innovation is also happening. So um, on this side, we, we have two innovation centers, East and West Coast in the US. And um, on this side of the pond, as it were, we established an innovation center in London. And um, we use that as a springboard to access innovation right across the UK and Europe. 
Um, as a result of that, uh, across these innovation centers, these four innovation centers, we have, uh, we have executed over 600 collaborations over the last eight years and deployed uh, north of $1 billion uh, in this exercise, in this effort since 2013. Um, the way we've set up these teams is, uh, and, and they're not physical laboratories in the main, although I will tell you a little bit about what we're doing in terms of physical laboratories. Uh, they're experts, uh, people. I think, you know, um, uh, in one of the introductions, it was mentioned that human connections and networks are incredibly important for innovation. This is absolutely true. Uh, collaboration and human interaction is probably the most important ingredient because that's where you really uh, leverage the best brains um, and this applies to every therapy area, uh, particularly neuroscience. Uh, so we establish in each of these innovation centers deep scientific and commercial expertise integrated in these regional teams. Where I work is in the Corporate Venture Fund. Um, and so what does that look like? Well, well, actually, long before, uh, eight years ago, when we established the innovation centers, J&J uh, &J had a corporate venture fund. Um, it actually uh, goes back to the early 1970s. It's the longest standing corporate venture fund in any industry, not just in um, healthcare and life sciences. Um, as an example, in 2020, we um, made over 45 investments. We co-create new companies and um, we deployed uh, more than $500 million in capital into those companies that we either invested in or uh, created and then invested. Um, and that's really, you know, my day job, if you like, is investing in early stage companies. And um, how do we do that? Well, uh, as I said, we create new companies. We identify, particularly in academia, um, a really innovative technology. And so... Um, as a direct example relevant to all of your expertise, um, we um, spun out um, a gene therapy technology from King's College London uh, in uh, 2020. Um, and if you see, you know, so we created the new company on the left hand side of this screen. We then invested in a seed round as part of that company creation, which we did um, in uh, the final quarter of 2020. And then uh, a year later, almost exactly a year later, uh, we raised um, a, an $80 million Series A to advance that technology into clinical trials. Uh, so it's very meaningful what we can do. This, this is not all coming from J&J, &J, to be clear, but this is coming from a syndicate of investors. But by working closely with academics and uh, scientific founders, um, and uh, with our ability to assemble the right capital um, and to put together uh, the right R&D plans and business plans, uh, we can uh, really help these companies to be successful. Um, in addition to our investment directly in companies like this, we also invest in incubators and accelerators. Let's see. So, so um, we have a highly differentiated model. We think um, uh, in J and J, we also where there are actual labs and offices, and uh, early stage companies are working uh, shoulder to shoulder uh, and are supported by teams that can um, mentor them, uh, that can coach uh, first time CEOs, that can give them access to venture funding, introduce them to people who are interested in investing in that space um, and uh, much more beside, besides. And we, we allow these companies, although this is a what we call a no strings attached model, and um, we don't obligate these companies to have a relationship with J&J as they sit in our incubator, but we provide a lot of contacts into J&J to try and help those companies, including um, a concept we call J-PALS, which is a a connection, an expert in, from inside our organization um, that has specific expertise that's relevant to that company that can help them with their needs and focus areas uh, and accelerate their growth. So, 
these incubators in Europe. The majority of these JLabs are actually in the US. And this is just an example. Uh, this, this incubator is on our big R&D site in Belgium. And it's just an example of some of the companies that are um, tenants and members of JLabs at PE in Belgium. Now we have, um, a, we really participate broadly in the ecosystem in um, across Europe uh, in completely different ways um, from country to country and from city to city. So for example, on the left-hand side of the slide, you see that we invest in financial financing vehicles and actual venture capital funds. Uh, and this is an example of some of the funds that we've invested in uh, and vehicles like Apollo Therapeutics, which is now a company. Um, but was originally um, a joint venture between three pharma companies and uh, three universities um, in the greater London area. Um, and uh, we were also a co-founder of the Dementia Discovery Fund, very relevant again to the interest of this group, um, where uh, along with seven other pharmaceutical companies, uh, we led the initiative to put together um, a significant fund that ultimately grew to 250 million pounds um, and has invested at this stage in over 16 companies, uh, all of them in early stage uh, discovery assets uh, for the treatment of dementia. And that fund is managed by a venture capital investor that we selected through a competitive process um, and is based in London. Um, we also collaborate uh, with large academic groups and uh, with governments. Uh, so just as an example, across Europe, you can see in a number of them indeed in the UK, and I'll, I'll give you a example of some of those a little later as it relates to the UK. But you can see that we have lots of collaborations ongoing um, in, the, in the UK specifically. Uh, we have a number of R&D sites around Europe, which are listed there. Uh, we have partnerships with other external incubators and accelerators, like Biomedics in Heidelberg, FutureX in Israel. Um, and then I mentioned the Innovation Center, which is in London. So we, we're a strategic investor. So we'll invest and collaborate in areas that are of strategic interest to J&J. Now I'm talking really about, about our pharmaceuticals business um, and uh, just giving you sort of a highlight of what we're interested in. You can see that your science is listed there. It's an important area for us. There are two areas of strategic interest for us in your science. Uh, uh, one is broadly neurodegenerative diseases, particularly Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, but also other diseases like Huntington's, et cetera. Um, and the second area uh, is mood disorders. And there we're really interested as a pharmaceutical company in the severe spectrum uh, of mood disorders, um, major depressive disorder and uh, psychosis. Okay, now in addition, to those uh, therapeutic areas, um, we have platform areas of interest as well. So our discovery product development and supply group, DPDS, uh, are looking for uh, novel small molecules and protein therapeutics and platforms relating uh, to their uh, discovery uh, and mRNA and siRNA therapeutics. They're also interested in cell and gene therapeutics. And I mentioned the fact that uh, I led an investment in a, um, a startup company in uh, gene therapy for neurodegenerative diseases last year. Um, and uh, they're also interested in data and analytics. Um, we have a relatively new um, data science group. We've always had data science embedded within each of our therapy areas, but we now have a standalone data science group that connects uh, with the um, therapy areas. Um, and we've got uh, a very strong interest uh, in uh, AI and machine learning um, uh, to drive drug discovery and development. Uh, and so we're, we're interested in, in increasing our understanding in, of biological insights and targets and trying to reduce cycle time for drug discovery and clinical development and to improve the quality of uh, NMEs, novel molecular entities. 
Um, so there are many applications for uh, AI and ML in drug development. We're looking to use leverage AI and ML to improve clinical trial design and to identify better endpoints, clinical endpoints, and patient stratification approaches um, to accelerate clinical trial operations. And we have a big focus worldwide in um, enhancing diversity and inclusion, particularly as it relates to clinical trials, something that's become very uh, apparent in the context of COVID and the development of the vaccines is that it's really important to develop drugs uh, mindful to uh, ethnic diversity uh, and gender diversity in your clinical trial populations. So that Psychiatry Consortium to everyone. We'll shortly be moving to questions to our speakers. Please add your questions in the Q&A box and we will answer them live. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to do it gently, Jean, but... <laughs> no problem. No problem. So we, we will move to Q&A. Uh, I think there's enough there. Let me see if... Um, uh, that's just a kind of a highlight of some of the some of the deals that we've done uh, since 2013, some of the metrics, I suppose, that we've achieved since since 2013 when we set up the innovation centers. So let me hand it back to you, Marianthi. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, Jim, thank you so much for this very informative and great uh, presentation, actually, about uh, how in j, j you are conducting all these collaborations. One of the questions is, Jean, for you, I think, um, we can start is what are the criteria? How do you decide uh, with which company or uh, academic group you know you want to do the collaboration? Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, very much um, uh, to do with our strategic interests. So um, we we recognised. Um, I've been with JJ seventeen years, and I would honestly say when I joined JJ. Uh, we were ranked about eighth pharmaceutical company, the pharmaceutical business now, okay, not talking about the broader healthcare business. Eighth in the world, we're now second or third in the world. And, and, and that growth has really uh, been a result of extreme focus in what we can do. So we really, um, you know, whichever therapy area you talk about, you know, I, I listed therapy areas, obviously looks very broad at that purview, but actually there are only certain things that we'll really engage on. So it's really got to be something that's a good fit for us. And that, that's for two reasons, because in every collaboration, uh, just to, like my colleague, um, uh, Asli Han was describing from a compass point of view, you know, we're very focused on bringing solutions to patients. And we feel we can do that effectively by being very focused in what we do. So it's really a matter of alignment and understanding with the scientists, with the academics and with the companies that we work with, that we have an aligned interest and that they're working on a target or a drug or a disease that's really of high strategic interest to us. It's, it, that's, our, that's our triage really. Okay, um, another question is if uh, a veterinary pharmacologist can fit in uh, to this uh, scheme of collaborations, um, either of you, Aslihan or Jean. Jean, do you, do you want to take this? Sorry. Well, I, I mean, we have about uh, collaboration in terms yes. of, yeah, go for it. Well, collaboration, I don't, I, what I can say is like, obviously, because toxicology is like a critical step in drug development, we hire many uh, veterinary surgeons in J&J, &J, you know, uh, that really populate our um, uh, GLP or uh, good laboratory practice uh, toxicology studies uh, that we have to uh, deliver as part of our package. So do we collaborate? Yes, we do on occasion, I would say. We do uh, more so probably with uh, contract research organizations that themselves also conduct toxicology studies and therefore hire uh, veterinary surgeons uh, than necessarily uh, directly with uh, veterinary groups that are doing research. Although I have seen some of those collaborations myself in the past, not many, but I have seen them, particularly, you know, if we were in a new disease area, we, we didn't, you know, we felt that the small animal models weren't very translatable. Uh, we might go to a large animal model facility to do some research work with them to see if they had a suitable large animal model for collaboration. Uh, 
and, and the company and through the companies that we invest in we also have those sort of collaborations so like the gene therapy company that i was referring to and um, they're doing a lot of collaboration with um uh, a sheep model so and that's through academic groups thank you jean uh, i think as we can uh, that question you could answer if you uh, directly collaborate with patients, basically patient organizations uh, yeah. to understand more about their needs and their aspects. Yes, yes, we do. Um, it's it's really tricky. I don't know if everyone is, is aware, but it, the, actually um, the, the networking or I guess like the collaboration with patients are highly regulated for pharmaceutical and healthcare companies for good reasons. Um, but there are ways to approach it. So we, are, we do currently have a couple patient organizations, or I can maybe say like intermediate organization that can put us a, uh, in touch with patients. And the way it works for people who are curious is that there's actually a group of patients that are selected. And if we have any research questions or we would like to test uh, some of our ideas, uh, then we can directly approach that group and their answers would be again, get back to us by, by the organization that we work with. Also, Aslikan, there is one question, you know, for you, because you mentioned about preclinical models. Mm -hmm. And um, the audience is asking here, are you thinking of new disease models or better preclinical measures or both? Uh, yeah. You would... mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the need is uh, the need is really everywhere. I mean, um, yeah, it's. I, I think we, we do need disease models, but again, like at my last slide was you know looking at articles. I think we now are all convinced that it's extremely complicated to bring like a disease state by itself into an animal um, as complex as the animal that might be. Um, so I think we are more and more also embracing to isolate the behavioral, especially behavioral, but otherwise disturbances and modeling those into animals and see whether our compounds, potential compounds would, would improve any of those states. But to me, you know, just like a better understanding of animal behavior um, to, and to, to build that translational thing is very, really, really important. So there's like a few checkboxes to create a good animal model. And the, the, I think, um, I mean, someone mentioned that their veterinarians like their the etiology of disease, but also the, the understanding of the, the natural animal behaviors are really hugely important. And I think we, are, we really need new models if we are going to keep doing animal research. So we would love to support it if, if people have ideas that might be applied to psychiatric uh, realms. But could I add? Yeah, yeah. Could I add there? Because actually, the UK really is in the forefront of this uh, space. I believe, um, you know, the uh, the UK Biobank. I'm sure many of the listeners have heard of. Uh, is a really important initiative to further the clinical translation uh, of, to solve this big problem around translation from animal models to human models, um, and we and other pharmaceutical companies. Uh, are collaborating uh, specifically with the UK Biobank doing genomics and proteomics studies uh, and doing whole genome sequencing on a subset of uh, um, the subjects that are participants in the Biobank uh, to really uh, strengthen our understanding of disease uh, and of targets. Um, so yeah, uh, this we consider this a, a really fruitful area of collaboration for academics in the UK uh, to be able to work with a consortium of industry partners and the UK Biobank. Um, and we have a number of other psychiatry and um, uh, neuroscience consortia in the UK, uh, also co-funded by the Wellcome Trust. So all of these things I think are really important and the UK is really quite far ahead of other countries, I would say, in this regard. Yep, very, very, very important point you made here, Jean. Um, there is one question I think uh, is more for Jean. It's about the legal departments, and you know how much uh, we su we all suffer <laughs> uh, when we try to make you know the legal documents about these collaborations, and uh, uh, they are asking if we have standard agreements and uh, uh, basically how quickly uh, this procedure can go uh, through our legal departments. Jean, do you want to take that? 
Yes, I, I'm happy to take that. I spend much of my time indeed looking at legal documents and uh, talking to our, our lawyers and other parties, external parties lawyers. Um, I would say uh, we generally don't work to templates, you know, templated agreements, because we just feel what we can really bring uh, to the transaction is a very flexible approach. We try to customize the legal structure. I mean, there are certain things that are important for J&J that will become apparent in a first draft of a legal document. But other than that, you know, we're looking for to be very flexible and to accommodate the needs of our uh, collaborative partner, as well as J&J's or Janssen's needs. Um, so yeah, we, do, we, we, we tend to avoid very boilerplated uh, agreements, actually. Um, because I'm so sorry, I'm going to have to yeah. dive in. It's so interesting. And there are so many amazing questions. Um, I just, yeah, I hesitate to stop this brilliant webinar. It's just been amazing. And but unfortunately, we have to keep to time. So I just very quickly thank you all for joining us today. And obviously, sincere thanks to Marianthi, Ashley Han and Jean for just a superb webinar. There's so many questions that we couldn't answer today, but we are carrying on this conversation um, in the final webinar of the series, Building Bridges Along the Psychiatric Drug Discovery Pipeline, which was, will be a solutions, uh, a focus on solutions of how to work together, bringing all aspects of the series together. And that will be on... Uh, Tuesday the 22nd of March at one o'clock so please join us then and thank you again sincerely everyone for joining us and have a good peaceful rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.